The exploratory tour up and down the River Thames is now in Alan's rearview mirror, or it would be if he had one. Onwards with some more improvements and embellishments then. We'll start this episode, which will cover a range of things, inside and initially on Alan's stern section. There's a hell of a lot of vertical surface space, some of it foil face insulation, and the rest being Alan's original gel coat. While some space is already claimed by stainless steel mirrors and equipment mountings, it makes sense to dedicate some other hitherto empty zones to storage for light items. I've been looking over these two stern corners of Alan, and I don't think that the area of fiberglass here is going to be very useful for anything apart from storage. So I'm going to put in some net storage. And although it looks a bit strange here that this one's going to go over um, the, the Solas life saving signals page, uh, the idea being is that I can make use of this area and that if there is an emergency, it will take two seconds to just pull this net down and be able to read what it says on there. Although you should already know what it says on there anyhow. I thought I'd leave it up as a bit of a... Uh, as a bit of a nod to Alan's past. But anyway, I'm going to use this entire area here and then on the other corner too to have net storage. And I'll show you how I put them up now. These are ready-made medium-sized nets I found on the interweb. And they are broadly marketed for boats, cars, and of course, dreaded hashtag van life people. These four corner anchors are supposed to stick on gently for ease of positioning as you finalize their location and then drill through the correct size for a screw. I found the adhesive to be a little overzealous, but sorted it out eventually. I suppose it would be fine to just screw straight through and move on with your life, but naturally, Alan deserves more. Behind this fiberglass surface is hard closed cell foam, which shouldn't really absorb moisture, but it's best that it stays 100% dry. A basic blob of sealant is deployed, and then I screw the screw into the screw hole, into the wall. Job done, and just needs repeating on the corners of a load of other nets around the boat, these aren't for long-term storage of gear, but for temporary stowage, especially when at sea and if Alan rolls around in his animated yet charming manner. Back to the post-Thames journey sort out. Yes, this is the pure scintillation of me removing salt and mud-soaked mooring lines. At present, there's only one mooring pillar on the bow, and on sea trials all my expert compatriots have noted the need for more. That will be a topic for a future episode. In the meantime, you can indulge in footage, cinematically orientated into the sun, of my rinsing the lines in fresh water. Salt and mud don't really make for content mooring lines. The visual state of the lower half of the hull isn't too encouraging. Alan sat moored up against a variety of pontoons and fenders recently. There's rope chafe and general scrapes. Although, it's mostly because this black coating is an epoxy primer with no abrasion resistant properties. In fact, it shows up marks like a chalkboard, which might be useful for planning future protection. So, that's useful, but not very attractive. Next, in extremely low temperatures, any metal fixings spanning the interface between inside and outside the boat will conduct cold inwards, or rather conduct the inner heat outwards. In any case, these handles will be very cold to touch. We're going to coat them. This won't stop much of the heat loss, that would require a redesign, but it will prevent cold damage to bare fingers. First I need to bring back this polished stainless steel to a rough key so that it can accept a primer. Then I'm using a good all-purpose primer I've been happy with on previous stainless steel jobs. A couple of notes before we turn things orange. Firstly, the rubber coating claims you can apply directly, but I felt the additional preparation can't hurt. Second, I could dismantle the latches and do all of this on a work surface, I want to see if I can get away with it in situ, as they are calibrated just right for my hatches. The dipping pot is too short and wide, so I've found some <clears throat> sample tubes. It's something of a guessing game to work out how much coating is needed. Too empty, and it will not reach the top of the area already primed. Too full, and it'll overflow. This is a moment when pure instinctive talent is priceless. I'm anticipating a little dripping, so I've deployed strategically located clumps of blue rag. I'm going to neaten up the transition from coating to bare metal later, but on the next few I can run a little masking tape around that location first and save myself the hassle. Anyway, they'll be pretty smart by the time I've got my ducks in a row. This is the first test one I've done, and I'm not convinced I'm doing this perfectly because controlling the drip at the bottom is difficult. What I can't do is flip it up vertically so that the drip equals out across the entire area of drying rubber. So I'm gonna to have to work out how this is gonna go. 
Typically, I'll have perfected the workflow by the time I get to doing the final latch, never to need the skill ever again. Before we slickly approach the final and rather exciting part of the episode, I've been remiss and left an old saga hanging a little. Many of you are in no doubt losing sleep over this week's long lack of closure on the engine bay extraction duct. The axial fans are long gone and I have a centrifugal one instead. It's great, lots of pressure, quiet, the microphone was turned up here, and no whining when being slowed down by a cheap PWM dimmer. I'll assemble the components and show you it in action. But now to what is to dominate my attention for a few upcoming episodes. Alan's original expedition plans did not involve much sunlight, so a solar rig was unnecessary. But that's changing slightly, so we're entering the not at all done to death on YouTube topic of off-grid solar power. I'm doing a comparison of premium and not so premium panels in the near future, but I've gone for these for Alan. Flexible-ish, you'll see why I say that in a few moments. They are 100 watts each, a nominal 12 volts, and I'm mounting two on either side of Alan, making two 200 watt pairs. They aren't the ones you can walk on, but I don't need to walk on them, so. This is my initial sketching out in reality of where I want them. Alan's hull is a more complex shape than it initially appears, so I couldn't do this on paper. They need to be securely bonded to the fiberglass, of course, but also I need a gap between them for masterful reasons I'll show you later in the year. That's the reason I'm not butting one up against the other. Tabs of masking tape have been quite useful, as I needed to keep readjusting. Rather like an old house, nothing on Alan is in a straight line, from the structure to my painted lines. I did the best job I could. I'm not sure those glorious amperes of solar energy will mind anyhow, as they stream down into Alan's battery bank. I'm bonding the top first, and keeping the other three sides taped down for now. The forward panel's lower, bow-end corner isn't liking the slight 3D contour on the hull, so I'll need to head-scratch over that conundrum. It needed three runs of tape. The first to protect the orange paint I don't want fouled up with squeezed-out overfill, one to protect the panel edge from the same, and a third to bind both together for an hour or two as the adhesive sealant starts to cure. This is all the tease you're going to get just now about a series of solar episodes, amongst others, and I'm sure you don't need me to show you the bonding down of a total of 16 panel edges in near-identical fashion. Solar experts, do impart your advice, requests and ideas in the comments please. Non-experts too, as that's fun. Before I go though, these are neat. Not an innovation or original, but neat. Head torches are all very well, but a couple of well-positioned motion detection magnetic LED lights means I'm decreasingly likely to trip or garrot myself when disembarking Alan after dark and having switched off the main power. That's it. Bye.